Welcome back to the DJ Sessions, where we feature the best DJs, producers, and musicians from around the world. I'm your host, Darren, and right now I'm sitting in the virtual studios in Seattle, Washington, with my guest, Ryan Katz, coming in. Where are you at today? Akron, Ohio, home of ah. LeBron James and the Black Keys, and I think that's everybody famous from Akron, Ohio. <laughs> ah. Well, we have a few famous people here from Seattle, like Bruce Just a few. Lee and Jimi Hendrix and... Those, those bands that came out in the 90s, you know, those guys. Sure. You know, but um, hey, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Really pleasure to have you here. Yeah, pleasure to be on. Now, you have a kind of an interesting career path that you've gone down here, coming into the electronic music world and being very heavily into that world from, uh, I think, 2012 to 2018. Um, you know, yes. I, I liked, I was reading your bio and some of the places, you know, uh, you said you had performed were... You know, um, everything from uh, thousands of attendees at laser tag arenas and trampoline parks. I think it was the trampoline park that got me the most. I don't think I've ever been to, I've been to a trampoline park before, right? but not as a converted into a, a, a electronic music event. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So this is, uh, it's funny we're going to touch on this right away because this is probably my most uh, proud thing I've done in in, in my electronic dance music career and really i you know you see people throw weeklies you see three people throw events with big artists you see but it's it's all the same stuff it's all just a bunch of people you know dancing and standing around and doing whatever and i'm like okay this is great like i'm having fun but i'm also i know i could have more fun and as somebody who i'm a rare breed i i don't really drink much i didn't do any drugs during my uh edm tenure i guess and and i just appreciate the music so much but that was my experience i was like what what can we do to amplify this experience without you know adding substances and i'm like what if we did this but my childhood one of my favorite childhood memories was doing laser tag just at laser tag arenas and i'm like you would always think about it and i don't know your experience of going to laser tag arenas but they always had like armin van buren or some kind of like heavy trance going on in the in the arena and I'm like, it just makes sense. EDM and laser tag, lasers in general, but laser tag, it just all makes sense. And the synergy is there. And it just, it would be so cool to throw an event at a laser tag arena. So I was like, okay, I need to find somebody with sound. Cause I just had, you know, my I, being a DJ and producer, I don't have like all the live stuff. So I found a guy uh, locally who would provide the sound for me and we split, you know, percentages and stuff. I said, let's, let's do this. Let's uh, hit up a local laser tag arena and let's let's try a rave there for lack of a better word and uh it was cool i mean they they were they were really open to it you know generally laser tag places are like a family friendly kind of environment so i'm like i don't know how they're going to receive that kind of uh proposition but they're like yeah we can we can rent the place out you can start it at like eight o'clock we can go till like two or three in the morning uh it was expensive and the ticket prices that i had to post kind of reflected that but i think people were okay with it because like I said, you're getting more than just going to a rave. You're getting a full immersive experience. We had it. So the DJs that we booked were piped into the arena. So you would hear their sets while you're playing. Not everybody would be playing at once because there was just hundreds and hundreds of people there. So you would, you would come out, you'd watch the DJ while the next group goes in and plays. And uh, the first one I did, I ah, got I, I, the year probably escapes me, but I'm going to just, throw a dart at the board and say 2015 maybe um i did six of these overall and the first three i did at laser tag arenas and obviously as it goes on pe people i think i learned quickly that throwing them too frequently was causing some sort of you know fatigue from it like okay i've done this already uh because as i kept going it was like yeah we're still great turnouts but it wasn't as great as the first one which was literally like thousands of people uh, so after the third one, I was like, okay, let's try to press the reset button and do something unique again. Uh, I'm like, what else is there that I can like throw a, a rave at that's not just like a warehouse or not just like uh, a Elks or, or whatever? Like, so I was like, what? There's a trampoline park there. I wonder if they'd be open to the idea. Then my mind starts going in lawyer mode. I'm not a lawyer, but it goes in lawyer mode. Like, oh my god, I'm gonna have all these issues of people breaking their necks and and whatnot because if you've been to a trampoline park before it's just uh it's not just like trampolines there's like ball pits there's uh basketball hoops and all that so i went to them with the same proposition 
But what helped me is that I already had a proof of concept being at these laser tag arenas. And they were like, okay, this seems like it's a, a cool idea. We can do this rental price, which actually it was cheaper than doing the laser tag arena. Um, did two or three of those. I think I did three of those. And uh, they were, again, it, it as it went on, it was not as successful as the first time because the first time for anything is really successful. But th- I think people enjoyed them even more um, because you were... This was a giant place. I mean, laser tag arenas are big, but this was this is a massive area, and we had it was cool because they had house speakers pumped throughout the whole arena because they usually do anyways, um, or the whole jump. I don't know what you'd call it, but uh, yeah, and, and we did that a couple of times, and luckily no injuries or anything like that. We did have people sign waivers, but um, yeah, that was a really cool time. And I, I think if you pulled people and said what would what did they like more, I think the trampoline park. I stopped doing it because honestly, because I, I had a kid and it was a, it was a financial risk and I wanted to take less financial risks. But uh, to say that I'll never do it again would be false because I really I think I think down the road here, uh, I've still kept this giant network of people that that went and I still you know remind them, hey, maybe in a, in a couple of years we'll, we'll start we'll do number seven. Um, and I think because I've taken this long break, three or four years of, of hosting those, that uh, I think number seven will pop off just as much as number one did. So yeah, that was that was a really fun thing to do, and it 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 uh, it, it provided people with more than just going to your average Saturday night or weekly kind of thing. And was that also inspired by the events that you were playing? Because you played on stage with some notable people, sounded like some big events there. Was that kind of like? I'm doing these big events and I want to do my own big events. So. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was definitely um, inspired by that. It was also inspired by just like crowd watching because you know, when you're DJing your, your job is to read the crowd. And uh, as, as uh, if I had a killer set, which I, more often than not, I did, I'm not going to be, you know, whatever, but more often than not, I did. I, I still felt like people were having 80% fun. Mm-hmm. instead of 100% fun. And I, I just wanted people to have 100% fun. So I was like, how can I do something to get that 20% in there without, you know, it's not my show. I'm just DJing. And I just had a really tough challenge to do that while I'm on stage. I tried to be, you know, and I didn't have the most, I didn't have the best stage presence in the world. I do much more now than I did. Um, but the one thing I will say for certain that I, and I will stick to this, whether I throw them in the future, I never booked myself. Uh, I know a lot of DJs and producers and no hate, but I know they like to book themselves. Um, I do get a little uh, sus, if you will, when when I see a, a DJ have his own event and he's headlining. I'm like, okay, you're kind of like, you know, you know you're, you're rigging the game. Um but I never booked myself because one, I had too much going on during the event to even worry about performing. Two, I I I wanted to be a patron to this event as much as anybody else, and not necessarily a DJ because I wanted to experience the what everybody else was experiencing. Um, and I wanted to help my friends out, help people who helped me out. You know, people that booked me and and uh, kind of show them gratitude for that. And if they were DJs, obviously I would I would book them and. Uh, I, I also made it a, a really strong point to no matter what, if I had five or six, usually had five or six DJs for these events, every single one was going to be a different subgenre of dance music because I wanted people go at one. I wanted to attract the, the broadest demographic I possibly could. Um, and I think that's we can touch on that. But I think that's something that a lot of promoters struggle to do. Um, and two, I just I, I variety is the spice of life. I mean, I didn't want to listen to house music for eight hours. I didn't want to listen to dubstep for eight hours. I didn't want to listen to hard style for eight hours or trance or whatever. Like I wanted it to be very um, diverse. So that's, that's kind of when you say things that I learned from performing and going into my own events, those were some things that definitely I probably wouldn't have done the same uh, if I hadn't been performing beforehand, if I just went in and decided to book a show. So yeah, that was pretty cool. Now, was was music something that you always were drawn towards in the sense of performance, like performing? Were you, did you start this at an early age or yeah, was this so something that came about? I, start, I got my first guitar when I was around 11 years old. Um, I, I 
when I was growing up in middle school and high school, and even some of college, I was I was not exactly the most uh, stage ready person. I always had an issue talking in front of people or being in front of a lot of people. Um, ironically, the third, second, second or third gig I ever had as a DJ, so around 2012, 2013-ish, uh, there's a festival in my area called Radiate Festival, and Auto Erotic was, was the headliner. There was a couple of really big artists on this bill, and I was friends with the promoter because, and we could touch on this, but I've, I've worked in the music business area just as long as I've been performing, um, so I knew him from that. And he was like, hey, we're going to have you close close out the night. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> so so 3 to 4 a.m. when everybody is is at their hypest, uh, they have the headliner go on and then I go on. I'm like, OK. And but this is this is like I said, it's my third set. I had very little knowledge compared to now as far as what's appropriate as far as far as closing a night out or what what I what I would have been done best as a set list. So I decided to do what I was familiar with was at the time, big room was so popular. So that was all I was doing. Uh, and I got the crowd, the crowd was hype. I got some really cool photos and stuff, but I do wish I had that opportunity again, because that, that was, uh, so the, the Agora theater is the venue. It's a capacity is 3,200 people and it was, it was sold out. Um, and I just wish I would have been able to do, I like, I didn't even use the mic because I was, I was so shy. I didn't. So I had my buddies out there hyping the crowd for me. Thank goodness. Cause I would, I was awkward. I was using a controller. I wasn't even on CDJs yet. It was, it was a mess in the best way possible. Cause I learned a lot from it, but uh, yeah, I, it took me a long time to, to be comfortable on stage. I would say the last two years of my DJ career, I was really into it. And I think if I went back now, I'd be as good as anybody because of my experience in bands. Now I'm in a couple of bands, or I, I wasn't a band. I'm in another band, and and when you when you're doing that kind of thing, you 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 don't have a pulpit, so to speak. When you're a DJ, you've got that the decks to quote unquote hide behind it, and it alleviates some of the anxiety. When you're playing an instrument, there's nothing. The guitar's small. You're not. There's nothing. Or if you're a vocalist, even even crazier. Um, there's nothing really to, to give you that sense of comfort. So you have to learn on the fly. Like this is my, you know, I'm getting out of my comfort level here. And, um, but I think it was good to have my third gig ever be in front of that many people because everything else after that was, I mean, it was, it was, it was a big deal, but it wasn't like, Oh my God, it's going to be this many people again. So, uh, yeah, that, that was definitely cool, but I've, I've definitely been performing my whole life. I find myself being one of these people who, if you know me as a friend and you don't know me in the music part of my life, you're like, you do that. That's what you do. Like, I could never see you doing that. People say that to me all the time, but I end up being like this kind of chameleon, if you will. Uh, and and it, it's worked out so far. So. So you've been doing this for a number of years and, you know, you look at, you look at bands like U2 or Rolling Stone stones and, you know, they're still at their rocking stages. They're still out there performing, doing stuff. Would you see yourself performing, being a performer, stage musician at the age of 70? I hope so. That would be really cool. So one of my favorite bands of, of all time is Slipknot. And those guys are, uh, I mean, they're in their mid fifties. Uh, I think, I think the oldest guy just turned 60 and you're, I mean, and that's like extremely aggressive music. It's nine guys on stage banging cans and screaming and head banging. And they're doing that at that age. So if they can do that, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm, I've got a great stage presence now, but I'm not wearing masks and jumpsuits and stuff. So if they can do that, I should have no problem being able to do the same thing at their age. And I hope that I can, I really do. Um, who knows? I know there's, unfortunately you can, you hear about plenty of bands and artists who do have to hang it up early because they are having trouble with, with aging. Uh, I don't know if you've seen in the news recently, but James Hetfield, the vocalist from Metallica, he was on stage and he, he like was candid to the crowd. He's like, I'm dealing with some anxiety right now. He's just getting over rehab from alcoholism and, and he's having a hard time, but in his band rallied around him and they're like, listen, we're going to do this. And it's, it was just, it's cool to see that human element come out in these people who we see as just superstars, larger than life people, but they're just humans at the end of the day. Uh, so, and I think, I think DJing, you still see that. I mean, Paul Oakenfold still, still doing sets and, and Darude and all these guys that, that are, you know, 
they're ancient now. I mean, I've got a buddy uh, uh, of mine, uh, DJ Virus uh, is what he went by as DJ. Actually, he went by Plus FX before then. Uh, his name is Joe Lanky. Um, he's sorry, Joe, if I get this wrong, I think he's 47 or 48 years old. Um, he still DJs. He still, he still has a great time. He's, he's somebody I definitely look up to. Uh, he's, he's, I would consider him a mentor in the dance music world. He came up with, uh, Richie Houghton and diesel boy in Pittsburgh. So he knows his shit. Uh, so that was, uh, that was really cool. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I saw this to, I manage musicians for a living and I tell this to my clients all the time is, Success has no expiration date. So no matter, no matter what kind of drive you have, that's all that matters. It, people, especially now in 2022, when things are so much more progressive than they were 20 years ago when there were these gatekeepers and these limits and all these things, uh, now is the time to really, if, if you are listening to this and you're older and you're just like, I, I want to chase this dream, but I feel like people won't take me, you know, take me seriously because I'm 50, because I'm 60, because I'm 70 now's the time do it because you're not this time period that we're living in is is so open to just just talent we're all appreciative of talent and we don't look like we used to at, at appearances or uh you know obviously there's exceptions to that but we don't look at, at, at things the same as we used to we're not as judgmental overall so that would be my message as my uh, as one of my first producers that i ever worked under you know says he comes back to me he's like you know I got over 2,300 episodes that I produced over the last, just from this series wow. alone. And, you know, all we had to, all we had for distribution back then was public access, mm -hmm. unless we bought beta cams, which were never, they're, they're expensive, sure. you know, to put shows on broad or had access. We didn't have access to beta cams. So public access was our deliverable. And, um, once it podcasting came out, once the, you know, Canon came out with this GL one camera, the XL one camera price point of a thousand dollars and it was broadcast quality. Well, now, now you go out and start filming and then you had things like final cut pro. Yeah. And eventually you had YouTube, you had podcasting, you had the video iPod come out. So now people would walk around with videos in their pocket. Finally, yeah. they could download and subscribe to, and then you go into live streaming and then you have the outlets like Spotify, Beatport, all those things coming into play. I think you're absolutely right. The, the technology has made it easier to distribute. If, if you're just a, I'm just starting this up right now at 70 years old, or I'm 15 years old and I want to start TikToking. I don't know if you can TikTok at 15. I don't. I don't yeah, I, I just got on TikTok, so I'm learning it on the fly as well. <laughs> Dude. I tell everyone, I think it's the most hilarious thing in the world. Oh my God. Uh, it's two, extremely addicting. Like yeah, I, I can't stop ago, scrolling. Yeah. Two months ago, I was laying in bed at 1130 at night and I'm going, let me just check this out. Let me just check this out. Mm -hmm. Before I realized it was 330 in the morning, yep. I was just laying in bed going, what the hell? <laughs> and it's designed perfectly for that. I mean, yeah. they know what they were doing when they, when they developed that app, right. they, they were like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to touch on all the dopamine levels of all these people and we're going to make them not put your phone down and that's i mean it works so yeah, good props yeah. to them <laughs> uh, they, they they just launched uh tiktok live now as a yeah i've been seeing that. twitch i just saw that and i'm like okay cool another another medium let's see how that comes out and that'll be yeah. pretty awesome but yeah technology in our in our i mean it's on our phone we can go live from our phone and be like here i am in the middle of something or make that video on the phone and shoot it up to the to the, sure. to the rest of the world so um yeah, definitely. It's, 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 I don't ever see me have an expiration age when it comes to this. Um, maybe I might not be in front of the camera as much, <laughs> but you know, that being said, that's awesome. Um, you know, you mentioned a little bit about, um, we'll focus on DJs here, but it, it is about stage performance a little bit, but do you think DJs should focus more on the quality of music and performance instead of images, the image and outfits? It uh, so that is a loaded question because it depends on the setting you're in, right? If you are, you know, and I guess you could make an argument for both, but let's say you're playing like ultra music festival, right? Where there's just this giant crowd and you're up there and your teeny tiny self, <laughs> and yeah, there's gonna be cameras on you. But personally, I would say your image during that kind of event doesn't matter as much because most people are not going to be seeing you if they are it's on a camera but really most people are going to be vibing in this giant area with their friends they're really more worried about the music than anything else 
um, which should always be the case in my, that's one of my boomer opinions, but uh, that should, should definitely be the case. Your, your first priority should be the music. Um, but I would say if you are trying to, and you have to really walk the line between gimmick and differentiating yourself, if you can do that properly and you're trying to become a brand, if you're trying to become a successful brand, especially locally, because when you start, everybody's a local artist at one point, there's nobody besides maybe like Steve Aoki or some of these other guys who came up for money and were able to have these resources. Uh, it, it, you're, you're a local artist and you got to figure out how am I going to uh, set myself apart from the guy that's doing the exact same thing an hour after me. Um, and w- whether it is your image or whether it is your stage presence or whether it is please don't throw cakes, but if it's something else, if it's, if it's something proprietary that you're doing, that is going to be memorable. It's going to be it, when people go to that rave, they'd be like, remember that guy that did that? Yeah. Okay. I want to go see him again. So I'm not saying you have to do that at first and then ditch it. Uh, and I'm not saying you have to sell out to do, to get to that next level, but the thesis is you have to find a way to set yourself apart, especially marketing uh, from everybody else. And it, it goes beyond the stage. It, it, it's, it goes to your logo. It goes to how your flyers look. It goes to how you're presented on social media, get professional photo shoots done, get live, live photo shoots done, um, get great merchandise. People forget because when you're a DJ, especially if you're a DJ and producer, because that you're more of an artist if you're both, but regardless, if you're a DJ or a producer, you're one person, but that doesn't mean you, you shouldn't treat yourself like a band would treat themselves because you're still a brand at the end of the day, just like a rapper would be a rapper's one person, but they treat themselves like a brand because that's what people gravitate towards. So along somewhere along the way, a lot of people forgot that a lot of people were like, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm just going to throw the records down and I'll be a, a sick DJ. And there's nothing, obviously you want to be the sickest DJ you can be. You want to be able to chop right you want to be able to get your timing down you want to be able to do multiple formats you want to be able to do all these things um but none of that's going to matter if you don't present yourself properly either same with bands if you you could be the most phenomenal guitarist in the world and there's a lot of bands out there that that have what's called riff salad where they're just playing complex time signatures crazy riffs crazy you know things but if they don't have a marketability to them if they're not accessible then none of that matters. Nobody's going to hear it. So you really have to balance both. Um, I would definitely say as things progress, as the younger generation, Gen Z runs the music industry. I just had this conversation with somebody yesterday. Uh, whether we like it or not, Gen Z creates trends and they're the ones that that dictate where things go in the music industry across all genres. Uh, and drip, you know, your image is important to Gen Z. So uh there, there. You have to balance your integrity, so not you know selling out. You, you don't want to be a carbon copy of a famous person. That's not what I'm saying. Um, and you know, being a great musician while also being able to brand yourself properly, but do it so you're comfortable too, because you don't want to be somebody you're not. Um, so it is a fine line. It's something that people have been chasing for as long as modern music's been in existence. Um, so that'd be my advice is I don't, I, I don't think there's one specific answer. Um, it's a lot e- to be, to be completely honest with you. It's a lot easier to work on your craft as a DJ musically than it is to work on your branding and your image, because I know most creative people have a hard time with marketing because they're so focused on the creative aspect, which is totally understandable. Um, but you kind of just have to figure out what, what, what am I seeing? that's popular? What am I seeing that's working really? And how can I not copy it, but how can I take inspiration from that to my own brand? So that'd be my advice. What, what measures do you take to actively promote yourself, your releases and your career? Is solid PR a real important asset for DJs to have? Yeah. Um, I know that if, if I was still doing it actively, I would have done things a little differently for one. (laughs) Uh, we can touch on the controversy, but I was uh, part of Plasma Pool Records, who recently has come under fire because it, uh, our A&Rs stole money from all of our artists on our roster. Uh, Mord Fustang, I'm sure you're familiar with him. He has come out on social media and just blasted uh, these A&Rs who I won't mention by name, but they, they stole money from all of us and they deserve 
what's coming to them. But uh, that's one thing. Find a label that's right. You know, because you and and I don't correct me if I'm wrong. I, again, I've it's been a couple of years, but I believe you still need a label to be on Beatport, correct? I believe so. I'm okay. we're we're starting up our own label here in uh, okay. six seven months. So we're, uh, okay. I will well, there have you go. Yeah, you'll you'll know for sure then. Yeah. But uh, it, yeah, I, it, I'm pretty sure you still need to be signed yeah. and signed as yeah. quote signed as different in, in, in EDM than it is as a band. But yeah. you be on a label to be on Beatport, so that's important because Beatport. Uh, to my knowledge, is still the end all be all of, of where people go to find their music and, and to spin and, and, and all that. Uh, SoundCloud's obviously great. I don't know if Spotify is as relevant to the EDM world as it is with other genres. Um, but that would be one. You know, the first thing is, is, is make sure that you're on all the platforms you need to be on. Um, two, like I said, photo shoot is really important because um, your image is you can promote your brand. But if you don't have the image that goes along with it, people are going to see it and be like, well, I'm not going to listen to this because look at the guy. Look at this. Looks like it was taken with a, uh, you know, a Kodak camera in 1995. And look what he's wearing. What is he wearing? What is this? So, you you know, you, you have to balance that. Um, PR w- with my band, I currently invest in PR um, and that it looks different with different genres, you know, with, with, with the band, it's all about playlisting because on Spotify, playlisting is everything. That's how you get your plays. Um, but uh, as far as, as EDM goes, I would, I would want, I would ask for my PR to do more placement. So more like, okay, I, I want you to be able to get my tracks to DJs that are at this level, because the biggest promotion you could possibly have as a producer is getting these big DJs to spin your music at festivals. And to be honest, if they like the music, the rest really doesn't matter. I have a buddy who, uh, he goes by Luminist. He was formerly a slave, but uh, he ended up having a really tight, relationship with bass nectar simply because he sent him his tunes and bass nectar was like yeah i'll play it at at these giant festivals and everything else you know worked up from there so um that would be my recommendation to focus on uh for for any kind of dance music well and it doesn't matter the genre if you're into tech house okay you get your music to to a to a top tech house uh i mean carl cox would be awesome um get, get your get you know anybody that that would be no matter how niche your genre is, is what I'm saying is, is, is there's still somebody at the top of it, right? There's still always going to be a, a DJ at the top of, of, you know, happy hardcore, if you will. So uh, find those guys, network with those people, get them your music. And the rest is, is really history. So that would be what I would say. How important is social media to you? Uh, um, depends on the platform because some platforms have become really, irrelevant as opposed to other ones have become like necessary. Facebook is really just not anything that it, that it is that it needs to be. I've only used it as far as in a band sense is I'll take like a 30 second clip of our music video and I'll boost the post for a hundred bucks and it gets people to check it out with, because when you, it has an autoplay when you scroll instead of having to click and then they'll click on the video and whatever. But a lot of producers and DJs don't have music videos. So that wouldn't really be relevant. Um, Instagram is awesome because obviously visual content is everything. And that's something you can do to give people like a behind the scenes look. So, you know, whether you're on stage and you want to take a, a, a little clip of, of, you know, your perspective or you want to take a clip of other DJs to show love, uh, photos, everything like that. Um, TikTok we talked about is exceptionally important because that's where Gen Z lives. That's where they are. That's what they, that's what they want to do. That's what they want to watch. Um, and be like, charisma is so underrated um and a lot of djs i understand because of the culture of edm aren't the most charismatic people in the world a lot of introverts in this in this community which is is fine be who you are but charisma is the end all be all of success if you want to be somebody people magnetize towards gravitate towards you got to be that person who's friendly who's open and really who's funny you got to be a funny guy you know, TikTok's all about funny. No one made a serious TikTok that popped off. You know, you got to you got to have some quirk to you. It doesn't have to be like slapstick humor or anything. But um, that would be something that I would certainly uh, be, take that creativity that that I know you have as a musician and apply it to your content on social media, because a lot of people are like, OK, I'm just going to post one picture of me DJing and that's enough for today. It's like, no, you gotta, you gotta really work at it. You gotta work at it as much as anything else. Um, 
Oh, who was it recently? Mike Shinoda from Lincoln Park just came out yesterday and said, uh, I'm, I, I don't like the fact that all of these artists have to be social media monkeys as well because they have so, much, so many other things to worry about. And while I understand the sentiment, because, yeah, I mean, as a musician, you, you have a lot on your plate, especially if you're trying to do this full time. Um, but at the same time, Mike, you know, Mike's a little older and, and Mike, Mike's had it, you know, from a musical standpoint and a brand standpoint, pretty easy. Uh, overall, Linkin Park is one of the biggest names in the world. Um, so I, I would I would take what he said with a grain of salt in, in the fact that, you, you again, you want your brand to shine and you can't have your brand shining without having the responsibility of, of, of the world we live in today. Things are not what they were 20 years ago. And there's a lot of people who are so stuck in their ways uh, that don't want to participate. They're like, I'm, you know, like anything I'm okay. Here's a great example. I'm a fan of, of the Cleveland baseball team who are now the guardians. Well, they were the Indians, but you have so many people saying Indians still. And I'm like, are you, are, are, are you having trouble? adapting you know I, i'd miss the name too but it's it's not going to go back like you know it's it, it's it's here to stay and you got to think about that with anything in life you just gotta you gotta push forward there's things in 2022 that i don't like definitely but you gotta play the game to win the game you know so uh that would be my social media recommendations but really the thesis is just adapt 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 and you'll be fine and speaking about it, kind of adapting and moving on you aren't really a DJ or producing much anymore. You've, you've moved into the full on band realm yes. uh, in 2018, joining a band audience of rain mm -hmm. and uh, Jen just recently starting your own band kill streak. Was that something that you were, were you in bands before you were a DJ or is this something that said I'm a DJ and now I'm going to go to this live, live production, this live music side of things. What, what, sure. what, made, what was that? transition and what made that happen yeah yeah uh so what like i said when i was 11 i got my first guitar and i took lessons for a little bit and i did mostly self-taught stuff my love from age of seven or eight has been heavy metal uh my gateway band so for those who don't know gateway band is a band that's not the genre you love but it is the, the it's close enough where you start to get into it so my gateway band oddly enough was creed i was a huge creed fan growing up i went to to a couple concerts and you know, they had a couple of songs with some heavier guitars and that led me into like Breaking Benjamin and Corn and Slipknot and et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it just evolved from there. And yeah, I was in high school I and, and my freshman year of college as well. I, I tried my luck at, at uh, some band, some band stuff, but it's as serious as you're going to be in high school. You know, it's not it's not uh, a established band by any means. It's just like you and your buddies playing your friends, grad parties and, and whatever or talent shows or or whatnot. So. I, I stopped doing that because, I mean, I went to college and that that was busy enough. But that's when I discovered DJing in college. And I had a few friends of mine that were uh, in the fraternities. And at the time, this is, you know, 2013 ish. And Jersey Shore was the most popular thing in the world. And house music in turn, especially big room and all that was the most popular thing in the world. And all these bro downs were going on. I'm like, you know, and I'm not you can see me on camera. I'm not a bro at all. And uh, I'm like, how can I be a part of this bro down? Cause I'm getting some FOMO right now. I want to be, you know, I don't want to be stuck in my dorm room. I want to have some fun. I'm like, what if I just be the music guy? What? Cause I've always had that background in music. I just want to play the music. So that kind of how, how it evolved. And then, you know, like I said, through my whole DJ career, I, I ended up, you know, I was, I started out the same as everybody else ended up becoming pretty successful towards the end playing with some really big acts playing some festivals on second tier uh, billing and all that and uh i felt like something was missing you know I, I felt like i'm playing all these other people's tracks i'm playing my own tracks but i i don't feel like i'm actually performing them i you know it, it, it's there's a definitely a, a difference or a disconnect between you know playing your own tracks through a speaker and then playing a guitar and creating or duplicating rather to masses live. And I'm like, you know, I, 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 I want to scratch that itch a little bit, but I didn't like, I didn't like quit DJing before I started a band or joined a band. I was kind of the same thing as, you know, when you're in a job, you don't want to quit before you have a new job. So I decided to wait until that opportunity came about. And I was actually at guitar center, just fiddling around with guitars and 
they have a billboard with like a bunch of bands looking for for uh you know guitarists or whatever and i saw one that looked interesting and i called the number and uh i joined this band called audience of rain uh in 20 2018 and it was cool at the time um <clears throat> i really just wanted to be in a band to be in a band at first uh and musically it wasn't necessarily my favorite thing in the world it wasn't terrible by any means i, I enjoyed playing the songs i wrote plenty of them um we ended up doing quite well I, I i've been a music manager like i said for since 2009 full-time since 2015 so i've been able to uh be kind of that player manager like they would have in sports and so i've i've been able to take all those skills and and whatever band i'm in i'm able to elevate that band exceptionally just from those business skills so where they were when i joined to where they are now <clears throat> i'm not gonna take all the credit by any means but uh certainly are in a different spot uh, we ended up playing a lot of big shows, opening for for a couple of really big big uh, bands, and uh, within within that time period, we ended up doing a cover song for uh, you know it's a bands. You know, it was all original music, but we were like, we want to capitalize on the success, so why not do a cover song? Get some fans that are uh, not necessarily into us now into us from knowing a, a relevant song, so or not relevant, but a song they knew. So we did uh, Backstreet Boys, Larger Than Life. It was like a, a rock and roll metal kind of cover. I guess the genre you would call it is like post grunge. So similar to Breaking Benjamin, Seether, that kind of stuff. Um, ended up, it's currently at 550,000 plays on Spotify. So it's like intensely large, um, larger than life, if you will. But um, um, so uh, that was cool. And, and what uh, a tie back to DJing, I had a buddy of mine who uh, I was a colleague with, you know, doing raves in Pittsburgh and, and stuff. And he was also into rock and roll. And he uh, hit me up one day. He's like, hey, I love that cover song your band did. I'm like, oh, thank you. He's like, so I'm a, I'm a DJ now at a strip club in Florida. And the girls love the song. We play it every night. It's requested by the guys and all this. I'm like, what? Like, that's just insane. So there you go. But uh, yeah, so, so I did that for a while. And it just got to the point where I'm like, I, I, I had this internal realization that I was I was in this band to be in, in a band rather than doing something I truly 100% love to do and no shade, no shade to the guys. You know, I, I get along with all of them. I still talk to them all the time. I still help with managerial stuff. Um, but I was like, I, I gotta, you know, I, 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 I want to, you know, I'm 31 years old and we talked about age, but as far as energy goes being on stage, I'm 31 years old. I'd like to spend my thirties doing something that, that I'm really, really hundred percent invested in. And they understood. So that was uh, July 2021 when I left, took a little bit of break and I ended up finding uh, this uh, vocalist in my area who uh, a weird, weird kind of thing. But I, you know, I, I'm an old man. I got a bad back. So I get massages once a month. And uh, I was talking to my masseuse and she was like, my husband's a metal vocalist. And I'm like, huh. So I eventually hit him up and uh, we started a band called Kill Streak, uh, which is currently active. And, and I've always wanted to have a band. Or even when I was a DJ, I wanted to do this where you have songs. Each song has like a theme, uh, not a gimmick, but just a theme to it. Um, there's a band called Ice Nine Kills. They're really popular in the metal world and all their songs are about horror movies. And I was like, what if we did a, a, a band where every song was about video games? And so that was like the light bulb. And, and I got all these guys together that are like minded that are in the same music. And for those that, that know, it's it's kind of like uh, me uh, metalcore, deathcore styles of really heavy music. But. Uh, the production is is top notch. I won't take any credit for that. I'll take a little bit, but not a lot. Um, and uh, we ended up writing our first song called No Scope, which came out May 13th. That is a Call of Duty themed song. We found a, a cool spot in uh, Youngstown, Ohio, that looks straight out of out of the video game, like a map. And we did a music video and currently sitting at about 40,000 plays on Spotify. So within a couple of weeks, which we're we're very happy with and uh yeah i think we, you know the next song is gonna be about halo and we're gonna do goldeneye and zelda and, and like it's cool because when you do stuff like that again the theme is you get people interested in your music who might not have been interested but they're like oh that's my favorite video game i gotta check out that song so whether you're a producer a dj or in a band you got to think about those things every, every band has a song about nothing you know you write about your your breakup or you write about something existential and it's like uh, we've all heard this like what, what what's new what can we hear that's new 
Mm-hmm. Obviously, you got to walk the line between cringe and and actually good substance. But uh, yeah, that's what I'm doing now. I'm in the band Kill Streak and uh, primarily a studio project because you know it, w- I I'm a family man now. Touring's kind of out of the picture. Um, but we are hoping to play some festivals once we have a, a big enough catalog and. Uh, yeah, I am finally doing something that I'm like, okay, I, I love the music 100%. I love the people in it 100%. And it just feels it just feels right. And that's not to say I was talking to you before we, we got on here. That's not to say that my EDM or DJ career is over. In fact, uh, I've made it clear that it's it's not over. It's it's just on a temporary hiatus until somebody gives me a phone call. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, ha- I'm happy to do that. And you apply so much from your DJ and producer career, whether it is producing the demos or whether it is having a stage presence, having that experience with a legitimate stage presence that you can bring over uh, to rock and roll and to metal and all that. So um, I, I, I said this before, but I, I would not be where I was in any band that I'm in without having my DJ career. That is a hundred percent accurate. And in addition to all of this, you also run liquid sound records. Yes. And it, you, you highlighted this, that it's the only full-time underground music management agency in North America. There you go. Yep. Tell us a little bit about that claim to, to kind of fame that why yeah. you hold that. Yeah. So, okay. Rewind button. Uh, we're going to go back to 2004 uh, when I was just a little kid, not a little kid. I was in uh, middle school, high school and uh, a lot of bands that I was into. And this is when the internet was, you know, really starting to come up and uh, I was on all the message boards and through the message boards, I met a guy named Tom Hazert, who uh, he is a big wig in the music industry, but he's a very personable guy. He discovered Limp Bizkit. He helped discover Corn. So he's a, you know, a guy that I was like right away. I'm like, I want to soak up all the knowledge. I didn't even know that at the time. I just thought he was a, a guy that knew some of the bands I like. So I hit him up and we started talking. And over the years, he kind of became my mentor and started teaching me about the business. He owned a label called Corporate Punishment Records for a while. And there's a lot of bands on there that I ended up getting these networking opportunities with. And eventually, uh, well, in high school, I started a booking agency agency in quotes because I was in high school. But uh, we did end up booking like bands like Mushroom Head and some other groups uh, with my buddy Ben Lubitz. Shout out Ben, who uh, founded Bravo Artist. He worked with Creative Artist Agency for a while. So it was cool to see like me and, and a good friend of mine from high school go off in our adulthood and both still do music full time, which is uh, great. Um, And then college came. I kind of put that on the back burner. And then uh, I decided that I, 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 you know, during my DJ time when I was like, I'm not in a band, what can I do to still scratch that itch? And obviously managing bands and managing artists was something that came to mind. And I had all these skills. I started doing it part time just to see, like, get, you know, get your business model down, figure out what's working, what's not working. Uh, and then eventually after college, you know, I had these odd jobs. I, I have a degree in sports administration, which has nothing to do with music. However, a lot of things that you learn in sports administration, you can easily apply to the music industry because at the end of the day, entertainment's entertainment. Um, so that gave me a lot of skills, but I, it's very hard to get in when the sports world, it's, it's structured so differently than, than the music world, because everything is, it's already there. Sports teams are already there. It's not like you just can be a musician and start your own thing. Um, so I was working for an event planning company for a while and it wasn't, it was a great company. The boss was not, I was not, it was not a nice guy. And I'm like, listen, I think I've got this business model down where I might be able to take that leap. I didn't have any kids at the time. I might be able to take this leap and see if it works full time. If it doesn't work full time. Okay. I can, I can figure it out. Uh, so I, I gave him my two weeks. I started doing it full time and, and I've, any any business owner will tell you straight up that your business model is never perfect. You're always adapting. You're always making it better. Um, so that would that my business model back then to what it is now is is exceptionally different. But I was able to really start a full time career, and it just kept growing and growing and growing. Where I had a, enough artists, where this was a sustainable thing, paying the bills and. Uh, that's where I am today. As far as my full-time career, I'm, I'm one of the few very fortunate people to say I have a full-time career in the music industry. Never in my wildest dreams, if you, I would have said that to my 13 year old self, you'd be like, I'll get out of here, dude, come on. So that was that, that I still pinch myself every day that, 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 that is happening. But, uh, it's also allowed me to be whatever I'm involved in, whether it is a podcast, whether it is a band, whether it is a DJ, 
been able to take all those skills from managing others and applying to myself. I'd be a horrible manager if I didn't take my own advice. So uh, that's you know that it's it's been it's been a blessing in so many different ways, and and I would not I would not change anything for the world. Especially you're going to make all the mistakes, you know, coming up like this. And um, I wouldn't I wouldn't change it any of them. I would I would keep them all the same. Describe a, a real life situation that inspired you to oh be my. in this business. Yeah. Okay. Oh my, I gotta think. I gotta. Th- oh, so really, I mean, it comes down to again the FOMO thing. You know, you you see you see the lifestyle, and yeah, it's very glitz and glamorized, and it's Hollywood and all that. But you see the lifestyle. A lot of people who work in the music industry, and nice cars. They got the yachts. They got they got the studio. They got they get to they get to literally hang out with their idols every day, and as as uh, superficial as that might be, when you're younger, when you're when I, when I started this, when you're younger, you that's that's what is attractive to you. That's like okay, I want to be that guy. I want to be the guy with the laminate on at the concert who can go anywhere he wants to go. I can. I want to be that guy who's who's uh, sitting there behind the decks in the studio. Uh, behind the boards in the studio saying, Hey, what if we, what if we try this instead? I think this is going to work better or whatever. So uh, overall it, w- it was just one of those things where I'm like, I just want to be that guy, you know, and everybody, everybody's got that. Everybody sees somebody on TV and they're like, I, I wish I was that dude. Uh, and, and you just have to manifest it if you will. And, and uh, that was the inspiration really. They're, they're, I wish I had a, a more um, uh, fancy answer, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I think that's, uh, being younger, I don't know what my inspiration would be today for sure. I, I have no idea. I'm glad I'm, I don't necessarily need that now, but, um, yeah, that, that was, that was it. How, how do you envision your life being 10 years from now? Mm. Oh, so I, 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 you know, it's one of those things that you talk about it with your family, you talk about it with your friends. I never want to retire because I, this is too much fun. You know, if I got, if I retired, I'd be, I'd I'd be pretty bored. I'd be pretty unfulfilled. So I could totally see myself, let alone 10 years from now, I could see myself being that old guy that like, Hey, Johnny, did you come out with that track today? I want to, you know, so I could see myself doing it at 70 or 80 to be completely honest with you. But, uh, 10 years, I'm hoping that man, the, the one thing I can say for sure is the most rewarding part about being a music manager is seeing your artist become successful because you know that you put your stamp on that. Obviously, it's their music. They have the talent. They have the work ethic to get to where they need to be, but they wouldn't get there without the tools that you gave them and putting them in the positions to succeed. Um, so anytime I have an artist that that becomes you know big time, I'll shout out uh, Dead Man Rashawn was an artist of mine who he performed at the BETs. He had a number one song on iTunes just some really cool stuff. Um, it, that was really just f- fulfilling to see that. Cause I know I'm like, you know, I, I got him the opportunities to get to those places, to do those things. There's plenty of other examples like that, but I really think in 10 years, I'm hoping I have hundreds and thousands of those stories because that's at the end of the day, that's, that's what I do this for. You know, I, I don't make millions of dollars. I don't drive Ferraris. I don't have a yacht. I do this for the love of it and whatever else happens happens and uh the meaning to life for me is happiness so if i'm happy in 10 years still doing this then fantastic that's what i'm hoping and who's been your biggest influence when it comes to your career as an artist and why hmm. as an artist uh well you can you can say djs and, and producers and and bands and all that so i'll i'll say from a dj producer standpoint I, I, I won't say that necessarily an inspiration. I guess I could say they're an inspiration. There's a group out there called Looney Tunes, uh, for those that might have heard of them. A uh, duo from, uh, I hope I'm not screwing this up, but I think they're from Belgium um, or Netherlands, one of the two. Uh, they do, they, they kind of pioneered with Yellow Claw. They kind of pioneered that like trap style where it's like trap and hard style because it's obviously the same BPM. And if you mesh it right, if you produce it right, it works really well. And I liked that because it kind of took a really new genre in trap and took an older genre and hard style and combined them. So you have people who are a fan of both and you can do cool, fun things with drops. You can do fun things in, in the songs in general. Uh, I got to open for them once. They actually came out and they're like, hey man, your set's awesome. I was like, yes, this is awesome. So uh, th- those guys were my inspiration definitely in uh, 
EDM. I also shout out uh, my cousin. He went by DJ Avedon. He was a producer and DJ in, in Los Angeles. This is at least 15 years ago, but I looked to him and I've always looked, he's always been ahead of the curve as far as trends go. So anything he ever did growing up, I was like, okay, I have to, I have to do that because that's what he's doing right now. And DJing was one of those things. And that's, that's really was the start of that. Uh, as far as managing goes, I wouldn't necessarily say from a managing perspective, from a business perspective, Rick Rubin was always that guy that I, I was like, you, you look at his discography as an engineer, as a producer, or, or as, as just that guy. He works with people of all genres. His, it's so long, and you're like, he did this legendary album, this one, this one. You're like, how did this one man help create this insane amount of material? It's just mind-blowing. Uh, as far as bands go, obviously, Slipknot, I, I say this all the time to my, my co-host of my podcast because we meet a lot of really cool people. So the only people I would ever truly fanboy over where I'd be like, oh, my God, uh, would be people from Slipknot because uh, I got their first record in 1997. Uh, they were a big part of my upbringing, uh, childhood as far as my musical interest. My guitar playing is very similar to what they do. Um and that would just be one of those things that I would be over the moon about. I'm fortunate enough that I also have a podcast where I get to talk to tons of big artists and I appreciate all of them. But I know if I ever get the chance to interview anybody from Slipknot, I'll probably be shaking and sweating and doing all the horrible things that I used to do. So, <laughs> yeah, That's, uh, I was asked that yesterday, I think, in an interview and mine's Carl Cox. OK, I think I kind okay. of be like. Okay, this is really cool, you know. Like, well, he's he's touched. He's 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 been a part of, of what six generations of dance music. I mean, the guy, you wouldn't you wouldn't have you wouldn't have dance music as it is without Carl Cox. That's that's a a definitive certainty, um, and just talent alone. It's just obviously from what I've seen, I've never met him, but obviously from what I've seen, he seems like a, a teddy bear, like the nicest guy. But when you watch his sets, it's so intimidating because you're like, I don't think I'll ever be able to do that. Like as, as, as hard as I work on DJing, I don't think I'll ever have that. He just oozes confidence. But if you're doing it that long, obviously, I hope you would. But he just it just seems there's people there are people like that play guitar. It seems like they're walking. It doesn't seem like they're trying. And I feel like Carl Cox is one of those DJs. So, definitely. Yeah, I definitely hear that. Well, is there anything you want to let our DJ sessions fans know about before we let you get back to hanging out with the two year old or <laughs> chilling in the studio? Sure. Uh, you know, like I, I already plugged my band. Uh, you can it, kill streak. The song is no scope. We'll have other songs out, but you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, anywhere you can find music. <laughs> um, our music video is out. Go check that out. It's really fun. Um, I have a podcast called the all things music podcast. Uh, we have episodes between weekly and monthly, depending on our guests. We only do pretty much in-person guests because, you know, no, I, I like this, but, uh, there is something to be said for, for camaraderie when you're in person. Um, as you know, as we talked about, you used to go to clubs all the time and do that. Uh, so I'm actually headed out on Thursday to Dallas, Texas to, uh, interview a bunch of artists at So What, so what Music Festival. There's three stages. There's a pop punk stage. There's a metal stage and there's a hip hop stage. So it's like you can see bands like The Devil Wears Prada and then go see a rapper like Waka Flocka Flame. And I just find that to be the coolest dichotomy of artists that you could find. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm out going out there. I've press press passes. I'm able to, to talk to those. So check if you want to check out a bunch of cool interviews coming up at festivals. Uh, again, type in all things music, just all things music in Spotify and Apple and blah, 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 blah. So <laughs> there you go. And that, yeah, that's, that would be uh, my plugs for the day. Awesome. Again, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the show. I do know what you mean about getting uh, back to those in-person interviews. We're so happy to get back to doing that. Uh, lots of stuff coming up, lots of artists and uh, we'll stay in touch with you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Ryan. Thank you. Don't forget to go to our website, thedjsessions.com. Find us on TikTok, find us on Instagram, Twitter, the book. You know, we're out there, thedjsessions.com. This is Darren coming to you from the virtual studios in Seattle, Washington. Ryan, all the way in from Ohio. What is it? Where is it at again in Ohio? Akron, Ohio. Akron, Ohio for the virtual sessions. And remember, on the DJ sessions, the music never stops. <laughs>